the unprecedented pace of disruption and uncertainty makes leadership more relevant today than ever before. It's not position or power, but your leadership skills that help you to think in unique creative ways. When faced with a crisis, a leader is forced to think and make critical decisions. A leader who empowers a team and gives the employees accountability increases the effectiveness of an organization. John Maxwell says that leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. Warren Bennis says leadership is the capacity to turn vision into reality. And Bill Gates says, as we look ahead into the next century, leaders will be those who empower others. Today, I have the honor to welcome Kevin Sicotti. Kevin Sicotti is a certified professional coach and past president of the ICF Nevada Professional Coaches Association. Through his work, he helps project managers as well as new and emerging leaders to build stronger, more sustainable relationships with their teams. His work results in higher engagement, increased productivity, and greater success for his clients and their organizations. With three decades of corporate leadership experience and more than a decade in coaching high performance individuals and teams, Kevin teaches leaders to understand emotional intelligence and intrinsic human needs and helps them use that knowledge to create deeper, more resonant connections that lay the foundation for exceptional teamwork, productivity, and achievement. His work has been praised as being on the cutting edge of personal growth and professional development. Welcome to this show, Kevin. Thanks for having me, Sajeev. It's a privilege to be here today. I'd like to begin by asking you, uh, what do you think are three traits that a project manager or a leader should have to thrive in a disruptive economy? Yeah, it, you know, that's such a great question. It's, it's a huge question. And obviously, th naming three traits is, is just going to scratch the surface. But based on the work that I've been doing for the last couple of decades, uh, one of the most important things I think any successful project manager needs is really a good grasp of their emotions and, and what I call emotional intelligence. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that we are not, you know, Dale Carnegie said it best, when dealing with people, remember, you're not dealing with creatures of logic, but creatures of emotion. And we are not thinking beings that feel, we're actually feeling beings that think. And, and I think one of the most important skills a good leader can develop is that skill of emotional intelligence. The good news is that it is a, a, a skill that can be developed and improved over time. Uh, along with that, I think another trait they need is, is the trait of resilience. Um, I'm sure that you've experienced this. Anybody who's been doing project management, as, as I did in my previous career, uh, can attest to the fact that there are typically at least as many, sometimes more failures than there are successes whenever you're leading a project, whether those are small failures or big ones. Um, and we have to learn to be more resilient in the face of those challenges. Uh, you know, and, and with this new disruptive economy that we're in, that there's just this constant churn, this cycle of change that can be overwhelming. And, and so uh, a successful project manager needs to learn to navigate those things and, and cultivate the ability to bounce back from tough times. Um, and I think a third essential trait is really the ability to connect with others, just as we're doing right here. We are halfway around the world from each other, and yet we, we are connecting. We've been talking for a few minutes before we started this uh, uh, broadcast, and, and we are connecting, and I love that. But you know, going right back to the first quote you gave from John Maxwell, I think that project management requires the skill of building rapport and connecting with others in order to create the influence that's needed 
to lead to successful project outcomes. Um, you know, leadership is influence, but how can you influence somebody who you don't know, like, or trust? And so that, that skill of connecting and building rapport is essential. Very good points, emotional intelligence, resilience, and connecting with others. Which brings me to the next question about a leader in a crisis. So how does a leader respond in times of crisis? And what are some of the important parts of that response, the effective response? Mm -hmm. You know, it was funny, as I, as I read through this question, um, the first thought that came to me was, uh, I learned how to deal more effectively and respond more effectively in a crisis by the first few times not doing it very well, <laughs> you know? And I think that's kind of how we learn, you know? We, we have a crisis, we panic, we get overwhelmed, you know, and, and that goes back to that emotional intelligence piece, uh, you know? But all that said, there, like, and, and you know this, it's such a, it's a simplistic thing to think that there is just, you know, one most important part. There's so many pieces. There's no single part of crisis response that I consider most important, but there are a number of things that you need to do well in order to manage a crisis uh, effectively. If I had to pick one, I, I'd say um, it's the ability to see things clearly and understand the nature of the problem with a clear vision. And in, in emotional intelligence, one of the key components I look for is something I call reality testing. And, and it refers to the ability to see things clearly and not get overwhelmed by the emotions during a crisis. Because if you can't see the problem clearly, then you can't solve it. And so that, that piece, I think, is one of the most important for any leader is, is you're not going to respond well if you're, you're not able to clearly see the problem for what it is. A leader and a team. How do you keep your team members connected and motivated in such times? And what can you do to support them? Yeah. You know, this, this is another question that really, you know, as you know, has multiple approaches to it. Uh, a couple of things I believe are critical uh, in order to effectively manage a crisis situation and keep people moving forward. Um, number one, make sure people know the bigger picture. Uh, by that, I mean, once there's a clear definition of the crisis, we know what the problem is that we're trying to solve, uh, then, you know, we, we have to clearly define that for them because in, in, uh, in any crisis, the leading cause of anxiety, fear, frustration, stress, is the uncertainty created by that crisis. Look at where we are right now with the COVID crisis, the COVID pandemic. There is so much uncertainty out there. What does this you know, disease actually do? How do we fight it? What's the best way to prevent it? How do, you know, on and on and on, all these myriad of questions. But all those questions do is create a lot of uncertainty. So what we need to be able to do is define, in mo and in most cases we can, you know, like COVID is obviously an over the top example, but in, in the workplace environment, if I as the leader can sit down and clearly define what the problem is, well, that helps ease their uncertainty a little bit. It's going to reduce the stress response so that people can then start to attack the problem instead of becoming a part of the problem. Um, I think also it's important that people have the opportunity to vent their concerns, their frustrations. Um, you know, I, I think... You know, it's important to keep them focused on that bigger picture. And, and many times people only have their piece of the project in mind, my little slice of the pie, but I don't have the full context of what the overall goal is. And giving them that allows them to rally around a cause, a larger cause, rather than focusing on just a single task or a series of tasks. Um, I think by giving them the bigger picture, that helps to motivate them. You know, everybody is motivated by something different and it's all intrinsic, but all of us, you know, as a collectively, one of the things that we know about people is they will work for a paycheck, but they will commit to a cause. Uh, and I think that that's what we can do when we can paint a picture of the bigger cause, why we're doing this, what's the benefit, who's going to, you know, uh, uh, gain as a result of this? How are we going to gain? What is it going to do for the organization? When you can lay all of that out, it helps people to rally around it 
rather than just looking at a single task or series of tasks where they may not see how it's interconnected with the other things. Um, and and, and that, that process of keeping them connected, it, it, it's, it requires ongoing support and maintenance. It's not something you do just one time. Uh, so, you know, that, you know, we have to get to know people one-on-one -on -one to the best of our knowledge. And even in a virtual world, we can still do that. We can still do that uh, because one of the, you know, going back to your, your quotes, you know, one of the things I think about is a quote I've read from a gentleman named Zig Ziglar, who is a wonderful sales coach and personal development uh, uh, proponent. And he said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's what they're looking for. Yeah, that's the human element uh, and uh, the connection that you can establish with people. And uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So if you look back uh, at your career as a coach or leader, what do you think is one of the biggest challenges that you have faced? Yeah. So, you know, I think uh, there, there's two different answers to this. How, what are the biggest challenges I faced as a coach, you know, because I've been doing this work for a little more than a decade now, but I think I'd rather look at it through the context of project management because that's what I did in my, in my previous career, which really led me to, to becoming a performance and, and high performance coach for project managers. Um, there was a project I worked, I worked for a company that employed about 3000 people. Uh, we had, we were about a two and a half billion dollar a year technology and manufacturing company. And uh, I worked on an ERP implementation that spanned about five years and cost about $65 million, where we took all these divergent systems around the company and put them all under one umbrella. And SAP uh, was, the, was the chosen program or package. Um, keeping all those parts moving forward was such an epic challenge. And, and it certainly required more than just one PM. I mean, we had multiple PMs on the project. We had multiple consultants. We had business process owners like myself. And, and the issues were so complex uh, and challenging. It was by far the biggest project I was ever a part of, by far the most challenging project, and probably won't the one that, you know, uh, looking at me right now, you, you know, you can't, you know, I'm, I'm a bald man, but I, I got a lot of, I earned a lot of gray hairs <laughs> during those, those five years of working on that project, uh, because communication was such a difficult thing to maneuver with all the stuff that we were trying to do. Um, and that made it very complicated. And I will say this, I didn't at that time have all the tools that I have now. And so, you know, I think if I could go back and, and do it over again, I certainly would bring more to the table in terms of my communication skills and my ability to pull more out of the people I was working with. Uh, and still, I don't know if it would have been any less painful. It was just, it was one of those projects that uh, when it was over, everybody went, oh, thank God we can breathe again. Today, uh, if you see the new norm is uh, a lot of tools and techniques. You have uh, Zoom, you have Skype, you have Google Meets, and you have so many other channels like uh, Slack and WhatsApp and you call it whatever. But we are missing the sort of face-to-face -face connection and co-localization, -localiz which, uh, which was a time just not long ago. So how do you lead in effectively in such a virtual workplace? You know, I, this is one, you know, for me, um, I've been working in a virtual workplace. This is literally how I do my work every day. And it's been that way for the last 12 years. So for me, it, it, it's fairly, it, I didn't have to pivot much, but for those people who, uh, unlike me, who have been working in a, you know, you're in an environment where everybody is there together in the same room. You can have those meetings. You can do the things you need to do. You can walk across the building or across the hallway to get to the people you need. This is a fundamental shift in how we work. And it is incredibly challenging for people. Um, in terms of the virtual environment, I think that for me, the most important uh, key is engagement. Um, I think, especially when it comes to like, I'll just, I'll just put it into one simple context, the virtual meeting. 
You know, how do we keep people connected and moving forward in a virtual meeting? Well, you know, we need to set boundaries. We need to have clear expectations. Those are critical factors. For example, when I, when I start to run a virtual meeting, I tell people, put away your distractions, turn off. Don't just close your, you know, uh, your email, exit out of it. Don't, don't be an email. Either put your cell phone, your smartphone on do not disturb or put it somewhere else. I want this meeting to be as short and quick as possible. Let's make sure we keep this moving along. I think that, you know, engagement is so critical because in this, in this environment, you know, especially when you're, you know, when you're sitting in a room, your, your peripheral vision, your eyes, your brain is able to take in all that information and put context to it. But when I'm looking at a screen and I may have in a Zoom meeting, 15, 20, 30 people in one virtual meeting, it's next to impossible to capture what's going on with all the faces. Your eyes are constantly darting around. It's a very distracting environment. And so I always tell people, I go, we have clarity is key. Engagement is key. Let's put away all potential distractions. Let's stay here in this room until we're done. Uh, you know, and, and, and I think that for me, the way to make that successful is keeping it short, eliminating any extraneous information. If it can be said in a text, an email, or whatever, do that. Anything that's critical, let's bring it into the room. But that way we engage people right from the start. Interesting. Many companies worldwide were taken by surprise when uh, this COVID-19 pandemic struck at the beginning of this year. So how do you actually preempt such a risk and factor it into your project management plan? Mm. You know, if I had the answer to that, Sajeev, I would probably be a very wealthy man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think if anything, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that there's, there's no way to plan for some things in life. We can do the best we can to manage risk, to, to do our best then to mitigate that risk once it's identified. But there's simply no playbook for what we're experiencing right now, which is why when I work with leaders, they talk so much about resilience, emotional intelligence, keeping your mind focused in a positive, productive direction. If all I was doing, you know, we've been in this, this pandemic, in this global shutdown, really, for a good three months now, closing in on four months. If all I'm doing is sitting and watching the news and listening to all the panic and all the negative, all of that, I, I would be a mess right now, as most people would be. And, and that's what, when you look around, um, you look at people who all they do is take in all that negative information. Well, what I always tell people is what's wrong is always available. So is what's right. Uh, so what are we looking for? So I'm making an effort to be fully informed, but to look at what's going wrong, but also what's going right. And how do I build some of that into what's happening here? I think in, in managing risk, uh, project risk is going to be, uh, you know, depending on the project, somewhat uh, less substantial than the risk we're facing in a global pandemic. Uh, but I think that it, the wise person looks at all of those risks and uh, hopes for the best and plans for the worst. Um, the, the challenge is that when that crisis hits and, and you know, you've been in project management for a long time, uh, you know, I've been a project manager coach for many, many years. And then prior to that, doing project management, the one constant that we know is stuff's going to go wrong. Things are going to go wrong on this project, but panic, chaos, and overwhelm won't solve it. So how do we manage ourselves through this uh, through this uh, crisis, and that way we provide certainty and a sense of of uh, uh, comfort for the people around us, so they can they can also let their guard down a little bit and focus on the problem rather than uh, uh, focus on solutions rather than just the problem. What do you see as a future for project managers? Mm. You know, I, I think. <laughs> You know, and I've said this for years, I think project management is one of the most important jobs on our planet. I mean, everything around us is a project. What we're using right now, this Zoom platform, this started as an idea in somebody's mind and they put a project team on it and said, make this work. 
you know, from the chair I'm sitting in to the computer I'm using to the light that's shining on me, everything that, that in our world is a project. And I think it's only becoming more prominent. Um, I think our world is changing in so many ways and project, the projects we're seeing are more and more complex, which means it's, it's more and more critical to have somebody who's looking at all parts of that project and can see the, the entire scope of that project and keep people moving forward. Um, the ability for project managers, um, they're critical to the ongoing success of any organization. I think any organization that doesn't have a project manager or a project or PMO, uh, they're behind the curve. They're, they're going to suffer because of it. If they just have an amateur running their projects, they're going to get amateur results and they're going to be left in the dark. I think that uh, uh, the future for project managers is, is as bright as it's ever been. And I think now, you know, so for me as a coach, coaching has been a profession for 30-ish years, close to 40, but really only on the forefront for about the last five years where it's really just exploded and mushroomed. And, and so with that awareness, you know, before it was like I was this lone voice out in the wilderness crying, hey, listen, you've got to talk about these things and we need to help you and work through. And, and the same with project managers. Project management hasn't been around as a profession that long. It's, it's still, you know, as a profession for both of us, you know, it's still, they're both still in their infancy stages. So I think the future is, is really unlimited for project managers and a great project manager, a, a, um, skilled project manager who's trained both on the hard skills of projects and on the soft skills of people, that person is going to be able to command a, a huge price in the market and they're going to be able to set themselves up for long-term success. Which brings me to my final question. Do you have any words of advice for uh, the youngsters, the millennials <laughs> who are going to enter the workforce as leaders and project managers? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I joke when I, I, I teach at, we were talking earlier before we started the broadcast, I teach at the University of Nevada, Reno, and I teach a class on project leadership. And, and I always tell them, I say, you know, you've got to be a little bit, you know, of a masochist to want to be a project manager because you, you get handed a project team that you didn't assemble. You get handed a project that you didn't design. Uh, you are responsible to make this thing go. You have people from all over the company who are from different departments, different skill levels, different experience, uh, probably conflicting bosses, competing agendas, and you as the project manager have no direct authority over them, and you get to make it all work. You got to be a little bit nuts to want to do that, because when the project goes well, the team gets the credit. When the project goes poorly, the project manager gets the credit. Uh, but all that said, I still stick by my, 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 my saying that, you know, it, it is a great profession. So here's what I would say to the youngsters. Be clear about what you want and then do everything you can to prepare yourself for success. And that means getting educated on the art and science of project management. There is so much, there's such a huge body of work out there around project management and all of the uh, intricacies of the processes and so forth, and then develop their emotional reserves or what I call emotional intelligence. Learn as much about people as you can. How do people behave? How do they respond in certain situations? How do I connect with them? How do I build rapport? Because at the end of the day, the hard skills are really the easy skills. The soft skills are the more difficult skills. And, and those are because people, people are hard to, to understand sometimes. And so we have to arm ourselves with every possible uh, uh, tool that we can have. And, and I would say to them, the biggest piece of advice I would say is remember this, no project manager ever succeeds without a project team. No project manager does it alone. That's the whole point. No project ever succeeded without people to make it happen. And I think project management is, is one of the most exciting, challenging, and rewarding fields there is in the world today. Thank you so much, Kevin. It was a pleasure speaking to you, listen to your wisdom and insights on all those questions. 
I'm sure I benefited a lot. And uh, I'm sure that a lot of people reading this interview or listening to this will benefit from it. So thank you so much. Good. You're welcome. And, and again, thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to, to meet you and to be a part of this. I wish you, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you.